I've been a professional copywriter all my working life, which is 350 years. At least that's what it feels like. Half that time I was in the corporate world <laughs> and half the time I've been a freelancer. Where the speaking and training comes in is that I realized uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago that as an experienced and senior copywriter, uh, we've been through a couple of recessions over here and people's budgets get cut and their marketing and copywriting budget is one of the first things they draw back on when times get tough. And I thought, well, what have I got that junior copywriters and people who um, haven't got the level of experience as me, people that don't charge the fees that I do, what have I got that they haven't got? And I realized then there was an opportunity in training and speaking about how to make your words work more effectively, how to identify your core message, um, how to make your website work, which is what we're talking about today. And so I now find I'm still a hands-on copywriter for a third of my time, but two thirds of my time I spend traveling the country, sometimes the world, training people how to write better, training people how to become copywriters, speaking about words that work, and um, traveling to lovely places like Cape Town. In fact, in December, I'm going to be in Canada speaking at CAPS. And that's not so much about writing, that's about uh, icebreakers and energizers for speakers and trainers, because sometimes the best way to get the message across, it's not the written word, it's not a piece of paper or something on screen. Sometimes the best way to get your message across is by an activity. And my new book and this new talk that I'm touring is all about those activities that psychologically help get the message into your audience's head. Very exciting. So Jackie, um, I, I know you're a very experienced speaker. Um, we've all got our videos off and you're going to be presenting to us now. Please know that we're, we're paying rapt attention and people are being very eager to, to be here. Um, so I'm sorry that there isn't all that energy and feedback, um, but we're going to hand it over to you to, to talk to us about now copywriting mistakes and, and criminal mistakes that we're making with our websites. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me. I'm honoured to be part of this first virtual meeting with my friends in Southern Africa and, and beyond. Um, what I've done is prepared a sort of top 10 rundown of the classic mistakes that speakers can make on their websites. I'm not going to be really technical, so I'm not going to talk about HTTPS or about the code or any of that, because I'm more interested in the content and the things that you can influence. So I'll tell you, what I will do at some points is share my screen, because my hope is that we can do some live demos and I don't want to name and shame anybody, uh, but what I'll do is share my screen and show you what I found and some useful tools that you can then play with um, and that will help you with your own web presence in future. And as Charlotte said, if you've got questions as we go along, then type them in the chat box. And there are a couple of people who kindly volunteered to have their site or their content reviewed. We'll see how we do with time and I'll save that to the end if we've got time. I haven't yet seen these websites from the volunteers. There's a bit of an echo going on. I hope you can hear me okay. Right, it's stopped now. Um, so I will do live site reviews. Fingers crossed if we get time. Um, and it will be as, as much a surprise to me as it will to everybody else because I haven't looked yet at what they are. Anyway, at number 10 in the rundown. I don't know, did you have that in South Africa? You had the chart hits and they start at number 10, they work up to what's number one. That's what I'm going to do. At number 10, uh, classic mistake speakers make is have a website that is hard to find. Because in preparation for this talk, I did a search. And I'm going to share my screen and show you what I found as a result of my search. So hopefully this will work. I'm going to hit share. So you should now see, uh, if I get rid of that, can you see my Google search box? Somebody, maybe Charlotte, if you unmute yourself. And uh, not yet. We can't. Normally a green box comes up and you have to um, click it. All right, I'm clicking the green, green box. box. We'll go around now the quick share. Now, here we go. Now it's sharing. Yes. 
So instead of my face, you should now see my Google screen yes. and my search box that says South Africa speakers. Yes. Now, if I click search, this is what I get, the wrong kind of speakers. Um, but if I scroll down, one of the first things I find is this link to conference speakers. I think you call it .coza, don't you? .co.za? Anyway. Yes, yeah. Don't so see .za, sometimes .co. This is what I looked at. So I click, and it's a little bit slow, probably because the video is using up my broadband. So I land on this website. And you've got a choice of speakers here. Now, I don't know if these are PSA members or not, but if I was searching for a speaker in South Africa, this is one of the bureaus or the websites that I might look at. And so some of the examples I'm going to use are from this website. Um, and I don't think any of these people are on the call, so it's all very neutral. Um, now... <laughs> Sorry, so, Jackie, if, you want, if you're going to explain... Jackie, if you're going to click on something random, then scroll down and click on Lorne Silkus for us because Annette Kemp is on the call and she's uh, helping Lorne. And uh, he's one of our members here in Cape Town. I remember meeting Lorne when I came over. And in fact, when he was in London, he and I met up in Covent Garden for a coffee and a chat. So we've stayed in touch on Facebook as well. Lovely to have friends from around the world. Um, Good. Uh, right, what was I going to say? Some of these speakers, I, these are listed on, a, on the bureau, um, and I searched each of their names in turn to see if I could find their own website. So not just their profile on here. I wanted to see if I could find their website. Uh, let me get back to stop sharing. I've got to go back to here, back to here. How do I stop my screen share? Maybe if I click that. No. Um, so up, up at the top of the screen, it should be a block to stop sharing. Oh, there it is. I've got a light pinned to the top of my screen. And that's what's hiding some of the instructions. <laughs> there we are. Uh, so I'm back. Um, OK. So many of those people I found in that search don't have a website. They've got their profile, but they don't have their own website. And if I was a booker, I might have a concern about that because I might want to know more about them than just what the Bureau has. Anyway, so that was number one in my, my list of mistakes. If you can't be found, then you can't be booked. Uh, so it seems common sense, really. Uh, but I think this is the booking process for speakers and trainers and facilitators and presenters and consultants and coaches, the kind of thing that we all are. People search your name and they want to see your public face to the world. Right, mistake number nine. And this is connected. And this is that Google has said that if your site is not mobile friendly, it won't appear in a search that's done on a mobile device. That's been the case for a while. And so Google, useful people that they are, have released a tool that you can check at a glance if your site is mobile friendly. So this is my mistake number nine, and I thought we'd do a live demo. So I need a volunteer, whoever's first to type their web address in the chat box, I'll then uh, copy paste that into Google's mobile friendly test tool and we'll see what it comes up with. Fingers crossed this will work. Okay, we've got one. Oh, hello. We've got several. I'm only going to use one. And the first one was carlspeaks.com. Oh, thanks everyone for um, being so interactive. But this is how it works. I'm just copying that. I'm going to go back to screen share. So if I click screen share and then I click uh, my browser and I click share, I've got the hang of this now. Now I'm going to go to this link. Hopefully you can now see. Um, Charlotte, please say yes. Google's a sort of grey yeah. that says is your web page mobile friendly. This web address. Yeah want to write it down is search.google.com slash test slash mobile friendly. 
So I'm going to paste that website in web address, that URL in the search box. Hope you can see that. And I click run test. And Google's testing it now. You should see the little blue bar scrolling along. I'm describing what's happening because I don't know how big it is appearing on your screen at your end. So the little blue bar is still scrolling and along. It's analyzing. Uh, it's nearly at the end, a little bit more to analysis to go. <laughs> what it should come back is a score on four categories that will tell you if this website works on a mobile device or not. You never know what's going to happen with a live demo, do you? It's always slightly risky. But this is so very exciting. It's free. You don't have to log in. As you can see, there's no registration required. Anyone can do this. And if you just search Google for mobile friendly, you'll find this link search.google.com slash test slash mobile friendly. Here we are. Hurrah! The page is mobile friendly. Can you see that? It says uh, it's easy to use on a mobile device. It does say there are page load page loading issues so you can click to view the details and then you can see these additional resources that google um, gives you access to and you can see a screenshot here i think you can probably see my mouse moving around on screen as well you can see this is what it looks like on a mobile device um, and if i view the details of the page loading issues it does say that 22 resources couldn't be loaded. So I, I'm not techy enough to interpret what all that means, um, but it's showing there are some errors for the Google bot. <laughs> and uh, that might be deliberate or it might be accidental. And it says something here is being ignored by Google. There's a bit of JavaScript, it says. So that's something that you might want to talk to your web designer, web developer about, because it's a bit outside the scope and remit of my understanding. I'm sorry about that. I'm more into the content, the words and the pictures and the pages and the structure. That's where I can help, not technically. Uh, right, now let me get back to stop sharing that. Uh, but that's a useful tool there for, um, Anybody, let me just copy it and paste it in the chat window. There you go. There's the link to the Google's mobile friendly search tool. So you can check your own site. You can check anybody's site. It's free. It's easy. And ideally, if you know your audience search you and you want to be found on search, and if you know they search you on a mobile device or an, an iPad or a tablet of some kind, and you want to be found, which to be honest, it doesn't apply to everyone. I can be found on search, but I'm not worried if I am or not because all my work comes to me from word of mouth. So don't get too hung up about being found on search if that's not your route to market. That's my disclaimer. Anyway, that's mistake number nine if it's one of your objectives. Uh, number eight, here's a mistake I found from my analysis of those websites on that speaker bureau I looked at. And that's a website that is obviously out of date. One of those speakers that appeared in that listing, their most recent blog post was six years ago. Now, if I'm a booker or a potential client looking at somebody's website and it hasn't been updated for six years, I'm going to start thinking, is that speaker still in business? Why is their content not fresh or refreshed? Why, at the very least, do they not... And here's a tip. If your website is wordpress.org, which um, over 30% of the world's websites are, or, or a CMS system where you can, content management system, sorry about the jargon. If it's the kind of website where you can go in and make your own edits, on WordPress at least, there is a plugin or a, a widget, a little um, free tool that you can add to your website to add functionality that makes your blog posts evergreen. What it means is it cuts the date off. If your content is evergreen, meaning that it never goes out of date, then why have a date on it that risks people looking at it and thinking, ah, oh, no one's looked at this site for months or years. Is it still active? Is it still alive? So that's mistake number eight. Um, make sure that it looks fresh. And one way to do that is by taking the dates off your evergreen blog posts. 
at number seven. And you'll notice a theme with all these mistakes. They're all about, ideally, about making stuff easy, making it easy for your audience, your target audience, your target market. So number seven is if your website is hard to read. Now, I'm going to show an example of what I mean. And um, so apologies to anyone that knows this speaker. It's screen share time again. I'm going to click this. I'm going to click this. I'm going to click this right here we go here we have Quinton oh he is a PSA SA Hall of Fame speaker sorry Quinton um, my problem with this home page someone say yes you can see it just to check that the technology is working yes we can see it hurrah um, my problem with this is twofold one is that there's so much capital letters. Can you see this bit at the top? Um, top international conference speaker is all capital letters. And then all of this originator of the acclaimed business presentations, blah, blah, blah. And then up to Hall of Fame, PSA, SA. All of that is capital letters and it's gold on black or white on black. There are two reasons why that is a challenge. Let me scroll down a bit more. And then you've got a whole load of white copy on a gray background. Um, and at least that's not all capital letters. Now, I'm going to come back out of screen share to explain why this is a problem. I'm going low tech now. I'm going pen and paper. I'm going to write a word on a piece of paper, I have to reach down and get one. Um, so say I write the word um, speaking and I'm going to write it in capital letters. Hold it up to my camera. Can you see the word speaking? In capital letters. Yes. If I now draw yes. What happens is once you have learned to read, let me um, explain this. My degree is psychology. Psychology and copywriting are very closely linked because what you're trying to do with copywriting, you're trying to use your words to influence behavior. You're trying to make someone take an action. You're trying to make them um, change their behavior or phone a number or download a document or give you their email. You're always trying to influence somebody to do something. So uh, with your words. Now, when people have learned to read, you no longer read by spelling it out letter by letter by letter. You read a whole word at a time. Your brain, uh, once it can read, it reads really quickly. And how you read is by the outlines of words. So I've drawn an outline around the word speaking in capital letters. You can see that it's a rectangle. Now, if I write yes. the word speaking in upper and lower case, and then I'm going to draw an outline around that. It's a bit rough and ready, but can you now see the shape of the word speaking? The outline? Yes. It, it's got ascenders and descenders. It goes up and down. And that is ease of reading, where ca all capitals is okay for the odd headline for two or three words at a time, but can you see how it slows down comprehension? If everything's capital letters, it's harder for your reader to make sense of it because they have, it slows down their reading capacity. Um, and that's the reason, it's because everything is the same shape instead of having all those little visual cues about the English language, having letters that go above and below the X height, as it's called technically, the height of the letter X. Uh, right, so there's a, another bit of information, makes it hard to read, and a small font is harder to read, and white on, uh, where there's low contrast, white on gray is harder to read. So, sorry, Quinton, <laughs> I didn't mean to embarrass anybody that anybody knows, um, but that was one of my tips, 
because you don't want to do anything that makes it difficult. Right, number six, mistake number six is uh, making it hard for people to buy. So when people are Googling around and they're trying to find a speaker or a trainer, presenter, whatever they're looking for, or they've met you offline and through your other marketing activity, they've got your business card because you've been networking and they're checking you out online. So they Google your name, they find your website and they decide, yes, this is the person I need to book or this is the person I need to have a conversation with to decide if we've got any uh, working opportunity potential to discuss. You've got to make it easy for them. Now, there are some things that will do that. Even two years ago or three years ago when I visited Cape Town, you had three seconds for them to get the idea of your website before they clicked away. Now it's down to half a half a second. So at a glance, they've got to be able to see who you are, what you do, that you're right for them, and that what you offer is what they need and what you want them to do next, most importantly. So some tips around that. One is that the expected place for contact details is top right on a web page. If your contact details are anywhere else, you're missing a trick because they um, if someone has to look around to find them, then that's a chance to lose that person. Tip even beyond that, and this is slightly technical, sorry, but if you have access to your meta, meta tags, your meta descriptions, or you can brief your web designer, you know when you do a Google search, you get a list of results and it will have a link and a couple of lines of text and a link and a couple of lines of text. Top tip, if you have your phone number or your contact details in that description text, it's called the description meta tag. Again, with WordPress, you can have plugins that will give you access to this and that, that will take us down a whole rabbit hole of SEO, which I don't want to talk about. Um, not on this call anyway. Then someone who searches you, they don't even need to see your website. They don't even need to click through in order to contact you because I don't know about you, but I use Google like an address book. I can't be bothered to find someone's business card that I met them ages ago. I just Google them. And if I can find their contact details without even visiting their site, then all the better. So top tip, put your phone number in your description tag or get someone to do that for you. On your website, have your contact details top right. And then some other things about calls to action. Every page, you have to tell people what is your most wanted response? What do you want them to do next? And some tips around that. One is um, you have to have what in marketing terms is called a call to action. Tell them what action you want them to take. Now, if you're as old as me, you will know that back in the old days, the only way to respond to anything was by clipping a coupon out of a magazine or a newspaper. And if you can imagine what a coupon looked like, it had a dotted line around it, it had a scissor symbol, and it had the words cut here. Because all the research shows more people cut it out if you have the scissors symbol and the words cut here. Today, if you ever do online shopping and it arrives in a plastic sack, you'll find there's a dotted line and a scissor, sorry, scissors, symbol and the words cut here and chances are unless you're a real rebel you cut along the dotted line because people are obedient the point of all that story is that people will do what you tell them and more people will do it if you tell them what you want them to do so instead of just having a phone number have call now it's free or you know whatever and the number the science shows more people will call it or if you say uh click the buy now button it's orange or whatever it is what it, you have to tell them what to do now the thing with calls to action is there's research to show more people click it when it's a button than they do if it's a text link and the wording on the button is critical you might know Shelley Rose Charvet wrote a book about the lab profile she spoke at PSA UK a while ago I think she's Canadian but anyway she's got some books on this and she said for example that if you have a blog post, a lot of us will have a blog with little teasers and read more links. And the idea is you want people to read your little heading and introduction and then click the read more button to read your full article and all your lovely content and wisdom that you're sharing. Now, if you say, instead of read more, if you say continue reading, what Shelley says is that more people will click it because 
there is a psych subtle psychological shift going on that read more that's what I call a top-down instruction. It's from you, the company, talking to the reader, reader, bossing them around saying, read more. Whereas if you say continue reading, that is granting the power to the reader. Psychologically, they think, oh, I've started reading, so I'll finish. And the evidence is more people click it. There is a whole load of stuff around this, what you say on the button to make people click it. And in fact, I've got a blog post um, that says about Best Buy, the company in America that sells, I think, household products. They, by changing the wording on their button, increased sales by $300 million. And it was because they had a buy now button or add to cart, add to basket button too early in the thought process. And when they changed that button to say next or continue, I can't remember the exact word, but I'll paste the link in the chat box um so that you can see they boosted sales so much because psychologically their people were on their website their customers looking at products they didn't want to buy it just yet they wanted to go one or two little steps further into the website and then commit to buy it it made all the difference to sales give me one second while i just type this um in my web browser so that i can paste it into this text box uh, give me a moment. This is no. Uh, Are you doing that, Ducky? That, that no point in delaying, is there? Let's do it right now. There we are. It's a blog post I wrote called "How to Make Your Call to Action Buttons Work Better." So there's something a little light reading for you later on. Right. Uh, that's tip number six. Tip number five was what I was talking about top down and bottom up. And I'm going to share screen because I want to show you a, uh, a more recent blog post than the one about the buttons uh, to explain what I'm talking about this top down bottom up language. Now give me one second before I share the screen. Um, so if I go to here and then I go to, because this is, this is an as yet unpublished blog post. This is how new it is. So I've just got to log in to my WordPress to access it. I've lined up most of the things I want to show you, but this one I haven't yet lined up. Those, all those, nearly there. Uh, preview, there we go. Now, if I go back here, click share screen again, come to here, come to here. Now what you should see is this picture here. There's me doing a talk uh, last week. Um, yeah. And this, oops, that zoomed up a bit bigger than I thought it would. This is a flip chart that I often draw. Can you see the flip chart? Uh, let me, now I've got to make it a bit smaller. What you can see on the flip chart, ignore me, <laughs> look at this, this stick man here, this is you, this stick person, and this is your message. And this stick person here is your target customer or client or reader. And what you're trying to do is get your message into the brain of your reader. The trouble is they've already got something in their brain and it's this thought here, what's in it for me? Now, normally your message is going to include the words I, us, we, our, your business name, whatever it is. But there are only two words that answers their question, what's in it for me? And that is the words you and your. There's only one word more powerful in the English language than that you and your, and that's their own name. And given that you're communicating via a website, in this case, you don't know their own name. With emails and private messages on social media, you might know their own name. You know how it is if you're at a party or a coffee shop or in a bar and you're in deep conversation and someone on the other side of the room uses your name. You know how your ears prick up and you can't help but listen. You go, oh, what? Who said? Hmm? You're talking to me? That's how powerful a person's own name is. So in marketing, you don't know their own name but you can use the words you and your 
in your web copy much more than I, us, we, and our. You almost cannot use them too often. And this is the reason why, and this is why I call it top-down language, is I, us, we, our, it's the company talking to the audience. Bottom-up language is using you and your. What it means is simply putting your reader or your audience member or your client or your booker, putting their point of view and their perspective at the center of all your communications. Right, let me stop screen sharing. It's back here again. Uh, that's tip number five. And specifically, this is a very common mistake that I see on websites. It says we offer, and there'll be a list of bullet points saying all the things you offer. Very natural, very common thing to do, but to, that's top-down language. We offer is like spreading out your wares on the table and saying, roll up, roll up and buy something. To change that to bottom-up language, all you do is change we offer into you can choose and then have your bullet point list. It's a very simple little twist that turns writing into copywriting. So there's my tip number five. Number four, psychologically again, anything you say about yourself, people are going to think um, you're after the money in their pocket. You, they know you're going to say, hey, I'm brilliant, buy me. And they see through that. So what works for you is any evidence you can provide to back up your claims, any social proof, so uh, testimonials, reviews, case studies, recommendations, all those things, whatever a third party says about you is more powerful than anything you say yourself. It's much more compelling. It's called social proof or trust signals. That means if you're selling products, you need reviews like Amazon. If you're selling a service, you need testimonials. If you're selling yourself, like on your LinkedIn profile, for example, um, you need recommendations. You can use client logos because at a glance, people can see them and say, ah, if so-and-so is good enough for the BBC, then they're good enough for me. You can use numbers, the number of countries where you've spoken or speeches you've delivered or blog posts you've written. And I'm going to share with you someone else's website that I found in my little preparation for this call because it's an example of a site that does this very well. Right, so back to screen share and here and share. So here we are, let me get rid of that. And I'm not sure if I can pronounce her name properly, Enkromel Andrew. I don't know if she's in PSA, but here's her website. Hopefully you can see that. And she's got this uh, pretty hard to read capital letters, unleash your superpower. You can probably see the contrast isn't great. Uh, in the UK, that would be breaking our Equality Act, our Disability Discrimination Act, because someone who's blind or poorly sighted and is using a screen reader to view the internet, their screen reader is not going to be able to read those words. But that's not the problem with this website. I mean, in fact, I'm not pointing at it as a problem really at all, because what I want to do is scroll down. And did you see those numbers spinning round? What she's doing here is saying she's got nine years experience, 26 articles in eight countries, 980 people. So at a glance, this is telling somebody who's looking at her website, it's giving her some credibility. I scroll down a bit more and she's got her logos. She's obviously a Toastmaster um, and a member of all these are clients or, or associations that she's connected with. And this is all shortcuts to decision making. What this does to somebody who's looking at her website, it says she's credible, she's serious, she's been doing this a while, she's trained, she's got some quality connections and all this is giving them third party evidence that she's good at what she does. So I just wanted to use her as a little case study. Oh, right, I can see some messages now. She's not yet joined, <laughs> um, but maybe she will. As a, now that she knows she's had a name check in a virtual meeting without even knowing about it. Right, so that's number four, mistake number three. And Enkramel has done this on her website. As I scrolled down, you might have noticed. Not having any video on your website is really missing a trick because video is absolutely how speaker bookers will judge a speaker. 
And given that you can make your own videos now on your smartphone and uh, without having to pay whole film crews and do it very expensive and professionally, uh, ideally you have a bit of both to be honest, but if you don't have video, that is the way the internet is going. So if you don't have video, you'll be left behind. What I mean by that is, first of all, the kind of showreel type video. You can have video testimonials and you can have, um, you can make blog posts into video using an app. You can, and we know that video gets more engagement. Now there is a reason why. Because we all have that fight or flight response mechanism built into us, it's hardwired into us as human beings, comes from way back when we were walking around and if you saw a snake move in the grass, um, your eye is attracted to that movement so that you can run away. Uh, or I don't know, what do you do with snakes? We don't have too many of them over here. Um, hit them on the head with a stick, I don't know. Uh, maybe not. But that's why the human eye goes to movement. It, picture yourself back in that bar or that coffee shop in deep conversation and the footballs on the television in the corner. Even if you're engrossed in, with your best friend in a really deep, con intense conversation, your eye cannot help but look at that football, that moving image in the corner, even if you're not interested in football. So we can't help it. And that's probably why videos on Facebook get 30% more clicks, videos in email newsletters get more views, videos on websites will be watched. Now, because attention spans are really short, keep them less than a minute or two, um, have longer videos as well if people want them. You can have your own YouTube channel, it's free. YouTube's owned by Google and YouTube is now the number one search engine in the world. So um, there's loads of other tips about video that I could share, but just if you haven't already got some, get some because it's absolutely, our expectation of an on-screen interaction is via the moving image. It's why this uh, virtual meeting will work because we can see, hopefully, <laughs> see movement and it's more engaging and you will learn and remember more that if I wrote all this in a great long essay, um, it wouldn't have the same amount of impact as it does because it's moving image. It's, it's hard to read on screen. It's because it's light shining directly into your eye and your eye muscle gets tired. It's, it's why we print out emails and we never got the paper-free office. So anyway, I've said enough about video. Mistake number two is uh, another thing that mistake that speakers make on websites is not having that answer to that question in that little thought bubble I drew earlier on, what's in it for me? That is what's in the brain of the person visiting your website. Now you want to answer that overtly because here's a story. This was a study some years ago about queuing and how angry people got when they were in a queue. Now you might know here in Britain, we have a culture of standing politely in a queue. I think this study was done in America, but it was queuing to use a photocopier and they wanted to see how angry people got when the researcher jumped into the queue. They pushed in out of turn. So the first part of the experiment, they pushed in and everyone got upset and angry. Second part of the experiment, they pushed in and they said, please can I go first because I've got to make some important copies for the board meeting. And everyone went, yes, fine, no problem, you can go first. No one got angry. Third time, they pushed in and they said, please can I go first because I want to make some copies. And everyone said, yeah, fine, no problem. Now they hadn't actually given a reason. The only difference was the word because. And this is the power of using, uh, explaining or answering what's in it for me in your marketing and in your, your content. So what it means is you have to give a reason to choose you. And if you are, let me use another analogy. If you're in a restaurant and the person serving you says, would you like to try the pie of the day? Um, you're going to answer in your head, well, yes, maybe I will, maybe I won't. If the server comes and says, would you like to try the pie of the day? B 
because it's the chef's grandmother's recipe and it's all freshly caught and locally sourced produce and it's all organic and or they give you a reason why to try the pie of the day all the research is more people will go yes i'll try the pie of the day it sounds amazing so this power of the word because whether it's implicit or it's overtly stated is something again that makes a real difference to um, whether or not people will go ahead and choose you. So top tip, whenever I'm working with clients on websites, you know most websites have a homepage and they have about us and they have our products or services. They might have testimonials and reviews of case studies if you're lucky and then a contact page and a blog page. Those are normal pages on a basic simple website. If in your about me section, you also have a why me page, or you have why me or why us instead of about me, more people will book you. Now I know this for a fact and I don't understand why more websites in the world don't do this because on my website, I've got a about me, but I've also got why me. And I know people have phoned me up and booked me specifically because when they contact me, they say, oh, I called you because you put such and such a thing about your experience. And I know that's on my why me page. So it's a really big missed trick. It's number two in my list of mistakes that speakers make because it answers what's in it for me. Now, number one mistake on my list is about the, making the customer journey too hard. It, that links a little bit back to one of my other suggestions. And here's some examples. I used to contact a printer for large format printing. When, when me or a client wanted a banner, and a huge piece of print. I used to have to phone up this printer and say, can I have a quote? The banner's gonna be these dimensions and these colors, and this is the date I need it. And two or three days later, they would email me back with a quote. One day they rang me up and they said, good news, we've now got online booking. You won't have to phone us up anymore. You won't have to delay anymore. All you have to do is go to our website, our very expensive brand new website, fill in all your details and the website will generate a quote for you instantly. Fantastic, I thought. So I went to their website, could see it was very expensive. They invested thousands in the functionality and the design. It looked amazing. But the first thing I had to do to get a quote was choose which printing press I wanted my banner to be printed on. Now, the trouble with that is I'm the user. I don't know what printing press it's going to be printed on. All I know is the size I want it to be and the colors I want on it and the deadline date and maybe the budget I have in mind. So their whole website was a complete waste of money because it didn't put the customer first. Now, lots of coaches and consultants make the same mistake because they have on their website, their list of services, a whole list of sub pages saying, we do this, we do that, we do this, we do that. And they're expecting the customer to choose their route through their website. So that's not how it should really be. As the web owner, the answer to getting over this is to always take your customer as your starting point and put yourself in their shoes. Estate agents, as we call them here, real estate agents, they generally do this very well. Real estate agents have four markets. They've got people trying to sell a house, people trying to buy a house, landlords trying to rent a room, tenants, uh, land, say that again, landlords trying to let a room and tenants trying to rent a room. And what that means is estate agent websites direct people very clearly down four different paths, four different routes through their website because those four audiences want four different things. If you're trying to sell a house, the only thing you want is a valuation. If you're trying to buy a house, the only thing you want is a search properties function in the postcode or the zip code area you're looking at. If you're a landlord, all you want is to find a tenant so you don't have empty rooms. If you're a tenant, all you want is a search function of rooms to rent. So take a lesson from estate agents. That is something I don't say very often. And if you've got more than one audience, make sure at a glance on your homepage or whatever landing page you drive them to with your other marketing, they know exactly the next step you want them to take and give them a call to action, clear, simple graphic, so that they can within half a second see what they need to do. Uh, that is my number one mistake that people miss that trick. I'm going to show you one more screen 
um, as an example of how this is done well. Again, it might be somebody you know, but I found this site by accident as part of my research. So here we go. Screen share, share this, click that, come to here, get to that. And it's Shelley Walters. The first thing that pops up here is a call to action to say, sign up to the newsletter. So I get rid of that. And what you see here is award-winning speaker, testimonials going on, nice colorful buttons uh, saying two calls to action to book her or to view keynotes first. And you can see happy audiences. You can see numbers. Let me scroll down. Numbers of the continents, countries, cities where she's spoken, a delegate she's reached. Then you've got um, South Africa's top sales speaker, she's called herself. Um, there's a video here with a nice pink play button. Scroll down. Big pink book now button. Uh, learn more. Let me scroll down. There's the blog to keep it fresh. And then the sign up again and logos at the bottom. 350 seminars and counting dot, dot, dot. Now, that is an example of a website that's obeying many of the rules and guidelines that I have just suggested. Now what I'm going to do is come back out of there, stop the screen share, come back to this. Um, and since I've been talking pretty much non-stop for uh, an hour, I think I'm going to shut up and answer some questions and perhaps review those volunteers sites who asked me to have a look at what they're doing. So back to Charlotte, can you? Um... Yeah. Jackie, well done. Now, that was really fascinating content. Uh, I know we've all taken uh, some notes and there's been some comments in the chat box here. So um, maybe what we could do is respond to one or two of those. Um, forgive me, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Is it Yoke or Yoka? Would you like to? Unmute yourself, Yoke, and then just uh, answer, ask your question. You were asking about uh, font size. Yes, yes. Jackie, thank you so much. Your content is amazing. My question is, um, you were saying sometimes it's hard to read and the font size is too small. So what is a good font size to have for general content on a website? What is the smallest we should go? Oh, that's hard to answer because actually people can enlarge the font if they press the plus on their keyboard or they stretch it on their touch screen. Um, but I also think it depends on the age of your audience you're trying to reach because when you get past 40, your eyes start going and you can't see the small print so easily anymore. So if you're trying to talk to um, un millennials under 35 years old, uh, then you might not have to worry too much about font size. I actually think 12 point is probably a minimum unless it's actual legal small print in a footer, your, your copyright notice or a little link like that. Um, but the, the trend for them at the moment is white backgrounds and big headings and big font sizes. You've probably seen, as you go browsing around the internet, you've probably seen that uh, a lot of websites look like that these days. And that's probably because a lot of people are viewing them on these little screens. Thank you. So 14 point is the new 12 point, it says. <laughs> In, <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go along with that. And I would also say, this is a top tip. When you have social media presence and you have your little avatar, your little profile photo, a lot of they're square shaped and often they're cut into a circle by whichever website, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, where you, where you have a presence. And be aware that keep that image really simple because most people are looking at it on a small screen and on the small screen, it's only 30 pixels square, that image. That's tiny. So if you have a really complex detailed logo or a photo of yourself in the distance and that's your avatar, most people are only going to see it in your updates and they're going to see it really tiny. 
So top tip, make it simple and clean and easy. Everything's about making it easy for people to consume your content and then to take the action you want them to take. That, that's really good, Jackie. We often see um, really obscure little logos. Um, we, we even had that problem with our own PSA Facebook page recently. We had to fix it up. All right, um, um, Neil's making a comment saying he's a brand new speaker, he needs a website, how does he begin? He doesn't even have any testimonials or videos yet. Well, Emil, you're, you're in the right place. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get you started, okay? And we'll, we'll be with you along this journey. Um, if anybody has some references for Emil who can do websites, uh, please be in contact with him. But uh, Emil, just, uh, if I haven't contacted you by tomorrow, then drop me an email and I'll introduce you to somebody who can help you to create a website he's done quite a few speaker websites so he knows what's happening. And uh, the testimonials and videos, we, we have to get started. Um, I have to confess that I've, um, I've only recently put website, a video on my own website and I hated it. And so uh, I keep wanting to take my video down. But um, yes, we, we do. There are lots of different ways of putting video on. So we do need to play around with that. All right, any other specific questions before we uh, give Jackie a chance to have a look Oh, Jackie's got something to say. Oh, only Jackie. that a website is not compulsory, and especially if you're starting out. But if nothing else, make sure your LinkedIn profile is up to date and is selling you as best it can, because that will come high in search no matter what, because there's nothing you can do that um, as an individual that's going to beat the power of a big website like LinkedIn. If you're starting from scratch, just make sure you collect testimonials from day one. And whenever anybody um, says something nice or sends you a thank you note, just respond to them and say, please, may I quote you? And then you start building a library of testimonials. Um, and the only That's very good. The other and, third and tip from a newbie is always monitor the source of all new inquiries because otherwise you won't know which of your marketing is working or not so when anybody new contacts you always always from day one ask them how did you hear about me and then you can monitor what works do more of it and find out what doesn't work and cut it out of your marketing activities so good luck good <laughs> thank you that, that's really fantastic all right we, we got two questions here um and annette is sharing some more content which is great um rowan i think your your question might be a little bit uh complicated for for this because we're talking about code and websites so um maybe we need to have a conversation with someone else about that but let's let's have a brief conversation about yoke's second question she says do you need a website in your own name or with speaker attached to it and let's just add in or do you need a website in the name of your product or your topic area how would you handle that jackie oh this is a question that comes up time and time again i uh, it, the answer is it depends it depends on what you're trying to achieve and who you're trying to reach most speakers it will make sense to have a website in your own name uh, if you've got the kind of name that's unique um that's fine if your name is also the name of a celebrity or somebody who's more famous than you are, then their website's going to appear above yours no matter what you do. Or if you've got a name that's really, really common, like over here, I don't know, John Smith or this Jane Brown, they're really common. Um, it's going to be very hard to be found for a search of that name. So, and if what you're trying to sell is yourself as a speaker, as opposed to anything else, or, or you have your name plus the word speaker, to distinguish you from someone else with the same name who does something else, then absolutely do that as well. Um, if you trade as a company, and for legal and accounting terms, I have a company name, but I found people, when you're an expert, people book you because you're you. So marketing yourself under your own name is probably the best way to go. But with the disclaimer that it, it all depends, it all depends what you're trying to achieve. That's very good. Jackie, I also want to add into that, that there's a lot of conversation that uh, talks about whether we should be branding ourselves primarily as a speaker, uh, in that obviously there are some conferences and, and the conference organizers and the bureaus that go out, you know, wake up in the morning looking for a speaker, but the majority of people who hire us in, in companies or come to seminars 
they're not looking to engage with a speaker. They're looking to engage with someone who can solve their problem. Uh, so every time we, you know, promote ourselves as a speaker first before anything else, uh, people say, well, I don't need a speaker. And then you say, well, this is the problem I solve. It's like, oh, that I need you now because, you know, they, they might need a copywriter way more than they're going to need or copyright an expert before they need a speaker. So, um, you know, it, it, it's not a conversation that we can easily wrap up um, about the name. Um, I know that I started, when I started, I, I started with a website in the name of my registered name of my company, uh, which didn't make much sense. Then I set up a website in my own name, except my name is, is shared by another, a lot of other Charlotte Kemp's around the world, uh, including a porn star, uh, which <laughs> does a bit of damage to my brand. <laughs> and uh, then recently I've set up a, a just a, I bought the URL and I redirected it to my website in the name of the brand that I'm marketing myself under the Futures Alchemist. And, um, and, and that makes it, you know, I, I can put that name forward. They're going to land back on the same website. I might develop two later on, but it's, it's a quick solution to this problem. Um, Lee has got a nice answer here. She's got a, a her full name is Lee Joy Mansell something Playdell. I've chosen to name my website uh, Lee Joy Inspires and uh, that's that's I think very nice, really good. Okay, all right, we have um, about fifteen minutes left. Jackie, do you want to have a look at someone's website? I know that we put Carl's website forward for you to have a quick look at. Um, okay, do you want to me, glance over that for us? Let me have a little look then. Right, I'm back to screen share. Uh, and here and here, this is uh, Carl's website. And the first thing I see is the, the, well, this is instant top of the head reactions. You've got a picture of a microphone. That is the point of view of the speaker rather than the point of view of the audience. And I think that would be my challenge with the picture because it's almost a top down picture, not a bottom up picture, if that makes sense. Growth on purpose uh, tells me something about what Carl speaks about. And then I've got a button, so that's good, with keynote speaker. And it looks like a, a go, uh, I'm not sure if it's a play button to a video. Um, but then we've got some who, what, when, where, why, how type questions, where you are. What's good about this is that it's saying... This is trying to talk from the point of view of the reader of this website. It's saying, and this, a little challenge with this, it's serif font. It's quite small. And because it's on the picture background, it's quite hard to read. But it is you focused language. It says you want a clear vision and strategy to build or grow your business. And you want your leaders and your teams on board. So it's got lots of you and your. So I'm reading this and I can think to myself, yes, I'm that, or no, I'm not. And if no, I'm not, then I'll go away and I won't waste anybody's time. Then he's got why, you know, I said how why me is important, why I am. Um, and then it says my gift and calling is to inspire, influence and challenge leaders to see and work towards a better tomorrow. Who I am, Africa's number one breakthrough coach and strategy consultant, there's some powerful stuff in here, which I actually like better than my gift and calling. My gift and calling is what I call top down because it's all about you. It fails the who cares test. No one cares what your gift and calling is. They only care what's in it for them. Um, but some numbers is one of 17 thought leaders influencing the $2 billion industry. Um, Africa's number one coach, breakthrough coach, strategy consultant. And then you've got next steps. So this is what to do, how it starts. It starts with a conversation. That's quite nice, that's conversational copy. But then the call to action says, why not call me and take advantage of our complimentary strategy consultation. Consultation for some reasons in italics and the rest of it isn't, I don't know why that would be. And I don't know why it says me and then our. Sorry, I'm getting very picky as a copywriter into the detail of this. Um, so I think that could be stronger because if it starts with a conversation, you'd have your call to action here so that they can actually read that and go, yep, I'm ready to go. What do I click? Uh, then there's the quote. Uh, without a strategy, your execution is aimless. Without execution, strategy is useless, which is quite a nice line. I can help you fix both. Um, let me scroll down a bit more before I, I give a bit of feedback. 
So why not call me, take advantage of your complimentary consultation? Again, that's italic. You'll get no pressure and no sales pitch, um, which is trying to reassure people. Um, I'm just skim reading this to see if there's anything useful I can add. Oh, why Carl? You know I like this. Well done, Carl. Why me? And then some evidence as a speaker, I've been inspiring audiences for 25 years, president of PSA Southern Africa, member of GSF, 17 thought leaders, strategist, coach. Um, oh, bit of video by the look of it. Yes, there we go. Some logos, good. Some numbers, good. Some social media, good. Contact details at the bottom, good. That is another place people will look. So there's no contact details top right. So a missed opportunity, maybe you could have your phone number there and there's no, was there an email sign up? I, if there was, I missed it. Um, now, what I was gonna say here was, let me stop screen sharing and come back. Um, this is a general tip for a lot of coaches that, a lot of people will say, have a page, why coaching, for example. And they're trying to convince people why you need a coach and then why you need me as your coach. Uh, uh, but it's why you is more important because no one's going to be on your site if they don't already know they need coaching. So the job of your site is not to convince them they need coaching. The job of your site is to convince them they need you. Does this make sense? because they're on your site either because they know who you are already and they're checking you out or they're on your site because they know they need a coach and they've been googling around or they've been recommended to you and they've landed on your site by accident by design by adwords by seo by social media somehow they've landed on your site they don't need convincing they need a coach they in their head they already know they need a coach they're looking at your site to say why do they need you as their coach and not somebody else down the road or in the next country or the next website they visit. So often um, this whole answering why me is the biggest thing, the biggest way your website can serve you because that's answering what's in the head at the point they're on the website because the website's just a step in your process. Something has happened before they visit your website and something will happen after they visit your website. Your website's just this piece in the middle it's the step in the process that has to just move them from where they were here to where they are there. Um, so, you know, well done. There's lots of great, great stuff about that website, Carl. There were just a few little observations as I scrolled through. And there, there was somebody else sent me something before the call. Uh, let me just see. Um, it was Vilmien, is that right? Did I pronounce that properly? Vilmien, yes. Vilmien. Um, I've turned my emails off because I didn't want them to keep pinging and interrupting us during the call, but perhaps if Vilmien's still here, could you repeat what it was that you wanted me to talk about? It was something to do with a video script. Maybe we've lost her. Oh, Vilmin, yes, I can see you're unmuted. So maybe you can repeat your question. I'll see if I can help. Oh, no, Jackie, it's, it's quite detailed. Now, I'm, I, you have my website there, but I'm redoing front and trying to redo a video and the webinar. So that is what I've emailed to you, but it's okay if it's not part of this session now. I'll contact okay. you privately. Okay, that's fine. So, any more for any more? We've Great. All right. Any, yeah. A few more minutes. Any more questions of a general nature, perhaps, for Jackie? Can, can I ask the question? Yes, Carl. Um, thank you, Jackie. That, that was very helpful, um, especially those little things that I missed. Um, just a question about a, a, a subscription or subscribe to an email. I, I purposefully haven't put anything on my website because... It kind of irritates me when I land on somebody's website and immediately they're asking me to subscribe to something and pop in my email address, especially the minute you land on the site. You, you haven't even done anything and, and people are already asking you for something. 
So mm. do you think, do you think that I should, everyone says now you, you must build a database and collect people's details. Nothing is compulsory. <laughs> it all depends on your objectives. Now what, what I say, um, I don't know if you know the story of Alice in Wonderland. That was something, <laughs> it was a British book. Um, yeah, I do. When Alice went through the looking glass into Wonderland and she got lost in the forest, she met the Cheshire cat and she said to the Cheshire cat, which way should I go? And the cat said, depends where you're trying to get to. And she said, I don't much mind. And the cat said, then it doesn't matter which way you go. Now that story illustrates all marketing because if you don't know what you're trying to achieve, it doesn't matter what you do. Okay. All marketing has an objective. Now, I, most of the clients and the people that I work with when we're talking about websites, their number one objective is to get booked, to get paid, to earn money. And so the whole website is designed working backwards from there. But number two objective is if they're not ready to buy at that instant, your next objective is to capture email addresses so you can stay in touch, so that you can remind them that you exist, so that you're thinking of them, you can continue to add value so that you can drip feed information because they might not be ready to buy straight away, but they've shown enough interest to land on your website in the first place. And then it might be months or years down the line. If you've stayed in touch with them, you'll be front of mind. It's a bit like networking. You know, if you go networking, the first time you meet someone, it's very unlikely they shake your hand and they say, oh yes, I'm ready to give you money right now, or I know somebody that I'm gonna refer you to. It takes time to build that relationship. And this is where newsletters fit in. Now, the trouble with calling it a newsletter is you're dead right, no one signs up for them anymore. All our inboxes are too busy, they're too full, we don't have time to read the newsletters we get, even the brilliant ones, we just don't have time. All our heads are overloaded and all our readers, all our audience inboxes, they're all the same. So tip one, don't call it a newsletter, call it a tip sheet or insights or offers and deals or whatever is something of high perceived value to them. Incentivize them to give you their precious email address by offering a white paper or an ebook or a downloadable something, whatever makes sense to you, which is low cost to you, but high value to them. Because that an email address and a list is a really precious thing <laughs> to you because of this opportunity, even if they never open it, but if it pops into their email inbox every month, at a minimum, um, your name is always going to be in front of their mind. So let me use the networking analogy again. If you go networking or you meet someone and they say to you, do you know a good accountant? Are you going to remember the one that you met last year or the one you met last week? You're going to remember the one you met last week because of the recency effect. It, or you're going to remember the one you've heard from every month for a year because you've had 12 contacts with them. That's the frequency effect. Or you're going to remember the one that's given you the most value. It might be the one that's a family member or that's done lots of great work for you before. So they've got high value to you. Recency, frequency and value were the three measures we used to use in corporate life to assess our customer database, which was a million people across the UK. And we ranked them because we knew whoever bought from us most recently was most likely to buy again. Who'd ever bought most frequently was most likely to buy again or whoever spent the most money was most likely to buy again. So recently, recency, frequency and value you can use in networking because with networking, the more you go, the more relationships you build, the more often you see people and you add value to them one way or another by being the life and soul of the party or being on the committee or, or by giving them referrals, you add value to them, they're more likely to reciprocate. And this is where the newsletter fits in psychologically, but don't call it a newsletter. Don't use the word subscribe because that makes it sound like a newsletter. So do some kind of lead generation, give some kind of offer, um, and in return, put yes please on your button, for example, or grab, grab your, claim your free resources, um, uh, go, or any kind of word on that button that doesn't make it sound like they're signing up for a newsletter. Your thing about pop-ups, is, um, yes, there's a suggestion in the chat box about exit pop-ups. I, Carl, was like you. I resisted pop-ups for years and years and years because I hated it when I went on other people's websites. And then I started it on mine. Now, I have to make a confession. Like 
uh, builders who have the most untidy house in the street. My website desperately needs updating, but I've been at capacity for so long, I haven't actually needed to update it, but I've definitely got to do a new video. I've definitely got to fix a little problem with the pop-up. I've definitely got to update it and make it more about speaking and training than copywriting, but park that thought. I started testing pop-ups on my own website and sure enough, signups went up by four times. Now, I don't know if any of those people went on to become customers um, because that's not a measure that I, I can even monitor. I just know that my list grew four times faster because of having a pop-up. And it might be people are filling it in just to make the window go away because they can't find the little X to close it. I don't know. Uh, but that's my own experience. And it, it's my recommendation to most people if it fits with your objectives, to reuse, recycle, repurpose blog posts in a digest or send them to your list. They land in people's inboxes and even if they don't open it, they're reminded who you are, what you do, and then you're front of mind when they or someone they know needs you. Sorry, that was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> no, but that was a really, really good answer, Jackie. Thank you. Um, I, I think many of us have that same thing. We have a little bit of, of, and we talk about it often in our Kate chapter in particular, kind of a distaste for, um, you know, personal promotion, which is a little bit foolish because we can't actually afford to, um, <laughs> to hire a PR company or a praise singer to go ahead and, and, and market ourselves. So, you know, we have to do it. And the newsletter question is raised very often, but I really like that. You know, we, we do need to communicate. I know very often that I want to go to somebody's website to sign up for a newsletter because I want that, I, I want to stay in touch. And even if they're not going to be a regular newsletter poster, um, I, I, I want to be reminded of them. And, and I get frustrated if I look and I can't see how to sign up for a newsletter. So I think we, we shouldn't discount it. There's still some really old fashioned people like me uh, who, who like to do that. Folks, I, I do see some other questions um, on, in the text box. Um, but these are really long questions. Uh, Annette wants to know where to blog on your own site, how to share. Um, Wilmin is asking about uh, script writing tips for social media promotions. And Lee's asking about best colors to use. These are all good questions, folks, but I'm afraid we have hit eight o'clock and that is our cutoff time. And we're, we're not gonna go beyond that. Uh, so I'm gonna suggest that this kind of conversation gets carried on in our own chapters or amongst ourselves. Um, and maybe Jackie might uh, there to answer one or two of your questions if you contact her directly and her website's easy to find because it's jackieberry.com is that right Jackie that's com? exactly right and um, I do practice what I preach so you should find me all over google if you type my name uh, or my business name or my slogan and um, I've just shared a link that will answer some of those questions. It's another blog post on my site about all the things you can do with your blog posts, including putting them on social media and uh, in a newsletter and in a book and in a video and lots of ways of repurposing content. So uh, thanks again for having me. I'm, yeah. Thank you for your comments. I can just glance and see a couple of um, Hopefully everyone's got some useful tip that they can take away and use and apply and do let me know how you get on with it. You'll find me on social media. Yes, Jackie, thank you. So folks, here's the challenge. Um, after you've spent two or three hours on Jackie's website reading all the blog posts, if your question hasn't yet been answered, then you can pop Jackie an email and ask her. Um, and also, you know, like I say, do, do have this conversation in your chapters and in your masterminds and uh, maybe in the online mastermind for online speakers, you might want to address one or two questions as well. But uh, th these are important things that, that we do need to wrestle with. None of these answers are solved immediately. These are things that we learn over time. And I know poor Carl has, has got some really good insight now. And Carl, I don't know how many times you're going to update that website and how many times you're going to keep asking us for insight. Um, you're doing a really good job of fine tuning everything. It's looking a lot better. And uh, so if you, if you use Carl's example, we just want to persevere folks, just keep going. And one day you'll be happy with your website. And then the next week you'll change it anyway. Jackie, thank you so much for your generous time and insight and your 10 tips. My it's pleasure. been very, very valuable. Yeah, and I'll we're all going to be, you know, friends. With the 10 tips so you can pass yeah. them on. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jackie. We'll have this up on the, uh, on the YouTube channel at some point before the end of the year. 
don't hold your breath. Um, if anybody's waiting for a copy of this, I have to edit it. And, uh, but we'll have a blog post up as well. and We'll share Jackie's tips on that as well. So from PSA SA to PSA UK, thank you very much, Jackie. Um, have a good evening and please pass on our greetings to your chapter. Will do. Thank you, you too. Bye, everybody. Hope to see you in real life one day.